examiner. And uh, this means the numbers regurgitated by the computer alone cannot be utilized to, as a source of a report. The uh, examiner will be conducting uh, his you know, uh, examination independently from computers because human can extract some features that the computers cannot, mm -hmm. and vice versa. So always those two components are moving together. In other it's words, called, uh, com uh, ultimate speaker recognition with human in the loop. That's another term. You always have a trained examiner listening, in other that words. That is correct. And your examiners are trained in the various methodologies available for speaker recognition. That is correct. The computer cannot really assess whether uh, you know, input and voices are produced under uh, inference of article, or computer cannot tell right now whether a person was happy, sad, or voice was you know, produced under uh, you know, abnormal due, mm -hmm. uh, duress. So to detect all of those, we have to depend upon the trained examiners. So you, these two... All right, we're going to step away and sort of like uh, at least conclude my show with a synopsis of what happened this morning. Still on the sand, that FBI voice analyst. Oh, Sonny Hostin, she's gone away from me, but that's okay because I have two other great minds with me. So Paige Pate, um, what this testimony boils down to is a person who is familiar with a loved one's voice is the best person to be able to identify a voice that's on a tape. That's right, and that's pretty much common sense. I don't know that we needed an expert to tell the jury that. I think they probably figured that out on their own. The one point the defense was able to make with this witness is that if you know the person whose voice it is, you may have some bias. Oh, yeah, yeah, it sounds like him, and then be positive that it is him. So there's some bias, but it's mostly it's going to be up to the person that knows the guy. Well, because you would think that when the defense has their turn to call their witnesses, mm -hmm. they're going to put a family member, maybe George Zimmerman's wife on the stand, yeah. who will say, that's my husband's voice screaming on that tape. And they actually mentioned that in the opening statement. There was a claim I thought was kind of far-fetched. that He said there was an uncle who heard the tape on television in another room and recognized Zimmerman. But again, I, I agree. I don't see why you needed two hours to tell me water is wet. This doesn't make much sense to me. Well, I, I think Sonny Hostin had a good point when she talked about the defense attorney, Don West, he likes to be very, very thorough. He does, obviously. I mean, this is not as bad as the knock-knock joke, but I do think he's boring the jury. I think he needs to make his points, be clear about him, because otherwise the jury's going to miss that. If you have one good point and you've got a witness up for two hours, the jury may not have heard that good point. Hit it, hit it hard, but then move on. So, so the next logical witness probably will be some member of Trayvon Martin's family, don't you think? Right, and I think that'll be good. They can tell, look, I've heard him scream. I remember he was excited after a game or in this sort of environment. And also, it helps establish the character. Remember, Zimmerman's, you know, the defense is trying to argue Trayvon attacked him. If you've got a family member up there saying, look, that's not who this kid is, I think that's something that really helps the prosecution. Something curious about in listening to the 911 call, and we've all heard it a million times, but the screaming stops immediately after the gunshot. As a defense attorney, what does that tell you, Paige? Well, I think it's going to be difficult for George Zimmerman to say he was screaming and then all of a sudden shot Trayvon Martin. I think it's much more likely to conclude, again, using common sense, and jurors do that, that the person who was shot was the one that was screaming right up until they were shot. Yeah, because you'd think, you know, after you shoot someone, your adrenaline would be going like mad and you would continue to say something or scream something or... Well, most definitely. You, you've just killed someone, or at least you've just shot someone. You don't even know if they're dead. You would continue screaming, get this body off of me. Oh, my goodness. That, that's always been something that the defense is going to have difficulty with. Why would George Zimmerman stop screaming after shooting as opposed to Trayvon if he just got shot? And, and will the prosecution get into that, you think? I think so. If not now, during the witnesses, they'll certainly use that in closing argument, and they'll make that argument. And that's what you do as a prosecutor. You can't really argue your case so much through the witnesses. You lay the foundation and you get out the points you hope to make and then try to tie it all up in closing arguments. Yeah, okay. so again, we were all surprised because we thought one of the detectives would take the stand, but he may during the morning, we just don't know. But I, I think you're right, Jason, it's more likely that a family member of Trayvon Martin's will take the stand, but we'll see, mm -hmm. we'll see, because hopefully this witness is just about wrapped up on both sides. <laughs> we don't know. Uh, thank you for joining me today. I'm Carol Costello. Newsroom continues after a break.